And we worship the amazing God who can handle grasping all of that with every person all over the world, all at once. And I can barely handle having my kids and my wife talk to me at the same time. You know? This is the God we're here to worship today. We have a couple of announcements. First of all, I uh, want to let you all know you, you get an extra special uh, blessing next week, a reprieve from me. I'm going to be out of town, uh, up in Michigan with my niece who's graduating. She's going to become a teacher. And so we are blessed that Jerry Smith, our lay leader, is going to be sharing God's message with us next Sunday. <laughs> you are now. <laughs> Uh, also, because next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, um, and I'll be out of town, we're going to hold off on Holy Communion next week in this service, and we're going to do it the following week, which I think is kind of fun. We're actually going to do it on Mother's Day. And, and the reason I love that is because uh, there are three Sundays a year that churches tend to be full, Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day. By the way, one of the Sundays that's notoriously always the lowest is Father's Day, believe it or not. Um, but I want to create space for those who perhaps haven't had a chance to receive Holy Communion in a while to have that opportunity. So we're really blessed we get to do that uh, in a couple of weeks. Also, I uh, want to let you know that, as you probably saw, the, the pink um, bookmarkers are out. These are our uh, Bible readings for this coming month. We are slowly walking through the entire Bible together as a church taking a little bit more than a year, so it's not as overwhelming. Uh, but especially this month, please make sure to keep an eye on the readings because it's going to bounce around just a little bit. Okay. Also want to let you know today is our Community Cares and uh, Moses Basket Sunday. And so on our Community Cares Sunday, uh, anybody that would like to bring in non-perishable foods, you're welcome to always bring them in. Please put them at the exit here, the bell tower, and they will make its way to, to community cares where it's going to feed families in our area that are in need. We're also going to be praying over our Moses baskets, and these baskets are going to be going out to expected mamas or potentially new mamas who are brave enough to say they need help and went to a pregnancy center. And so we are really honestly jazzed that we can even be, just be a small part of those young lives. Anything else for the good of the family? You'll join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your home, to worship you, to spend time with you, to recognize that you want an individual relationship with each and every one of us, that you will always be there to listen, that you always care that you always have our best intentions in your heart and you know what is right. And so as we want to give you all of our worship today and always, we promise to also sit open-hearted for whatever it is you teach each and every one of us individually. We pray this in Christ's name.
so y'all can have a seat. And if you have your Bibles, grab them with me. We're going to head over to the book of Numbers, chapter 35, verses 1 to 8. Numbers 35, 1-8. As you're on your way over there, let me kind of set the scene for you, okay? The Israelites have now wandered in the wilderness for just over 39-ish years. God is using Moses and the current high priest, Eleazar, to begin dividing up the promised land, what we call Israel today, for the 12 tribes of Israel. But one of those tribes, instead of getting a section... It's a little piece of every one of those areas. It's the tribe of the Levites. And the reason why is because uh, if, you, if you've been reading with us, the Levites are the people who work in the temple. Their, their job is to take care of the church, if you will. And it's kind of cool because in the New Testament, Paul equates you with the Levites. He says that you are the holy people. You are the workers of the church. You are the leaders. You are the ones to be about his work. And I love that they don't just sit there cloistered all by themselves in the corner, but they're literally in every community. Y'all, as Christians, our job is not just to sit here cloistered in this little building. Our job is to be out doing the work of God all over the community. So listen to this from Numbers 35, verses 1 to 8 from the Word of God. On the plains of Moab, by the Jordan River, across from the city of Jericho, the Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites to give the Levites towns to live in for, uh, from the inheritance the Israelites will possess, and give them pasture lands around the towns. Then they will have towns to live in and pastures for, their, for the cattle they own and all their own animals. The pasture lands around the towns that you give the Levites will extend a thousand cubits from the town wall. Outside the town, measure 2,000 cubits on the east side, 2,000 on the south side, 2,000 on the west, and 2,000 on the north, with the town in the center. They will have this as a pasture land for the towns. Six of the towns you give the Levites will be cities for refuge. That is for people who are fleeing or people who are new to the area. They will, uh, which are persons who have killed someone where they may flee. In other words, before their trial, so that the family of the deceased doesn't attack them first. Y'all, are we supposed to be a place of refuge? In addition, give them 42 other towns. In all, you must give the Levites 48 towns, together with their pasture lands. The towns you give the Levites from the land of the Israelites' possession are to be given in um, preparation. I can't say it. I can't say it. Say it. Thank you. My tongue was stuck. In the inheritance of each tribe. Take many of the towns from tribes that have many, but few from, from the ones who have few. The word of God for you, the people of God. Y'all, let's continue our worshiping together as we give back to God just the little of what he's given to us through our tithes, our offerings, and our prayer requests.
First and foremost, we pray that this honors you. Secondly, Lord, we pray that everything here would always only be used in the ways you wish. To further your kingdom, to build up those who are in need and who are hurting. In the same way, Lord, we pray that you multiply this. Rather, it is prayer requests, it is tangible. Or, Lord, we are just being willing to say we give you who we are. We pray that you would use all we are to do immeasurably more than we can ever consider. And, Lord, we, we feel like we can be bold enough to ask this, not because we have some kind of right to it, but, Lord, because we want everything good that comes out of us to honor you. In the same way, Heavenly Father God, we thank you for these baskets and the hands that prepared them. We pray, Lord, that these would go out and these would bless some beautiful babies. That you would be with the mamas and in the daddies and that you would bind those families close together. Make them know you better than we do. And Holy Spirit, in the same way, may we never stop knowing you better ourselves. And so it is in this part of just authenticity that we come before your throne wanting to worship you. And we take a minute right now as we join our voices together as one and pray that beautiful prayer that, that Jesus Christ taught us, the Lord's Prayer, which is also on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You all may have a seat. I want to invite the kids that want you to come on down and join me. I want to invite y'all to join me and see that Jesus loves you. Did y'all know that preachers invented Snuggies? Y'all know what Snuggies are? Like those blanket rope thingies? Okay. We've been wearing them for hundreds of years. It's great stuff. Come on over. I know that was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. Okay. So we have, oh, Alara has a prayer request for us. So what, what is your prayer request? There's some tornadoes in the um, west part of our country, I believe, the other day. A lot of people lost property. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, CJ, you have a clue for us of what's inside? Yes. That thing is church appropriate. Like, <laughs> it's church appropriate. Okay, I'm happy so far. <laughs> All right. A class! No. But, and this is something God made, but somebody was good. Okay, something that God made, but people replicated. Some of your, okay. An animal? Yes. An animal. What kind? A bunny. Is it a, yes. It's a bunny. Okay. <laughs> that went really fast. I wasn't even keeping up. And they sing. Ah! Yes, I go ahead and stand up and show everybody. But it's small. When he squeezes it, it seems Jesus loves me. I have one too. I love it. They said for church appropriate. It is very church appropriate. Yes. Like <laughs> 
Easter. You got it for Easter. Awesome. And, and you know what? So when you squeeze it, can you hear that? I love it. That's awesome. And you know what else is interesting? It says, it says Jesus loves me, and there's a cross, and it's stitched onto him forever. How cool is that? Yes. It's like it's become a part of him. You know, how many of you grew up seeing in that song, Jesus Loves Me? Like, a lot. Yeah? How many of you knew that there's like four verses to it, not just the one we've seen on Sundays? Do you know that? It's kind of cool. Like, Google it when you get home. But, this song, Jesus Loves Me, is something that we've seen every Sunday, right? Yes. Yes. And it's not just a time filler waiting for you guys to come down the stairs. But, it's got an important message. I mean, honestly, do you know that Jesus loves you? Yes. Do you know that there is nothing in this world, nothing you could ever do that would ever make him stop loving you? Do you know that? Yes. Do you know that Jesus will always be proud of you? Yes. He might not always be proud of what you do, but he'll be proud of you. You are important to Jesus. Okay, and, and, and so in the same way, what, what happens is when we realize that this isn't just a song or that what we do here isn't just a ritual, y'all. Okay, this isn't just a, something to do on Sunday or to look good in the community, but that we actually have Jesus in our hearts. We've been changed. You have a love inside of you. You don't have to feel the guilt of shame of, of the bad things that you've done. There's a joy in us. There's a happiness there's an excitement about being one of Jesus' followers. And so in the same way that this little bunny has that song written upon his heart, and he sings it every time you squeeze him, and he has the phrase, Jesus loves me, stitched right onto him. It's part of who he is. So I want you guys to know that all the Sunday school lessons, all the sermons, everything else, we don't do these things just because, oh, we're supposed to, and mommy or daddy make us do it. It's because God has a love for you that is so important, so big, that it can change who you are on the inside and the outside. Okay? Yes. All right. Let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. Please be with those. Please be with those. Affected by the tornadoes. And help me to be changed. That I may know your joy. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Their inheritance will be added to that of the tribe. Uh, inheritance will be added to that of the tribe into which they marry. And their property will be taken from, from the tribal inheritance of our ancestors. Then the Lord commanded Moses, Give this order to the Israelites. What the tribes of the descendants of Joseph the son is right. This is what the Lord commands from Zelophehad's daughters. They may marry anyone they please, as long as they marry within the, their father's tribal clan. No inheritance in Israel is to pass from one tribe to another. For every Israelite shall keep the tribal inheritance of their ancestors. The word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, anybody else thoroughly confused? Oh good, you all get it. Alright, amen, let's go home. <laughs> All right, no, see, this can kind of feel a little confusing. And, and so let me take a step backwards here and explain this a little bit more. First of all, as I think most of us know, we have been slowly walking through the Bible. And this last week, I spent like three days in the, the last quarter, the last third, really, uh, of, of the book of Numbers. Because I'm like, okay, God, what do you want me to share? If I'm going to be preaching through the Bible, I should probably preach through the Bible. And, and I got like nothing for the longest time. I was praying about a thing about it. I mean, most of it is like there's an entire chapter where it's like they went here and then they went here and then they went here. They wandered through the wilderness. You know, I'm like, how am I going to make a sermon out of that? And then, then there's other parts that's like, okay, here's this sacrificial ritual and here's this one and here's this one. I just wasn't feeling the Holy Spirit moving me. You know. <laughs> So I was praying about it, and, and as, as you may know, we, we started into the book of Luke. And the reason why is because um, I'd like us to prepare for uh, a holiday that we don't often take time to really celebrate deeply, and that's uh, Pentecost. That's coming up soon. So we're actually going to be reading about Pentecost on the day of Pentecost. Um, if you don't know that story, um, stay tuned. You're going to love it. But... It was really tempting just to jump into Luke, you know? But I just felt the Lord nudging me and saying, look, if you say you're going to preach through the whole Bible, then you really do have to preach through the whole Bible. It's like, okay, all right. So I started praying about it, thinking about it. And this story comes to me uh, about the daughters of Zelophehad. And I'm like, okay, it's, you know, this is, by the way, the last chapter of the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers is the journey in the wilderness as they prepare to enter into the promised land. And you almost expect the book to end with, like, this huge fanfare, you know. They cross over and they possess the land. And there's, like, trumpets and blasts and all kinds of great things. And, you know, um, milk and honey flow everywhere kind of thing. Notice this random story about these girls. That's, like, how the book ends. And it's like, okay, we're done. Next book of the Bible. Well, in order to understand this, we got to take a step backwards here. Um, in, in Numbers 26. What we find in Numbers 26 is that Zelephah had, had five daughters and absolutely no sons. Numbers 27, we find that these five daughters go up to Moses and Eleazar, that's the high priest of the time, that's Aaron's son. Aaron is the brother of Moses, so Moses and his nephew, okay? And they say, look, our dad died in the wilderness. He didn't do anything like horrible that God spit him dead or something. But he had no sons. Would you consider giving us his land that he has an inheritance of when we get the promised land? And Moses and Eleazar prayed about it. And God said, yes. That if, if there are no sons, then give the land to the daughters. Which, by the way, is an amazing concept to consider all the way back in the book of Numbers. That God is honoring these women in this culture and time. God says, during this time and culture, that these women can have this property. Even more interesting than that is this is the first biblical account that I'm aware of, of any woman owning property, period, in the Bible. And it was by God's command. How cool is that? Just to show us the value and the importance that God has of all people, not just some people. 
And so by the time our scripture gets here, and at the very end of Numbers, Numbers 36, what we find is that, that the people in the tribe of these five girls, these uh, Zelophehad's daughters, they're like, hey, you know, something just kind of struck us. You know, they go up to Moses and Eleazar and the other leaders of the community. They go, wait, you know, if these girls marry somebody that's not in our tribe, and, and, and then they, you know, maybe have kids or whatever, and, and, and then when the parents die, who gets the property? Well, the kids do. Well, what tribe are the kids? Well, it's the tribe of their father, because that's what happens. When you get married, you get married into a tribe. So you're telling me that we're going to lose our land. God made a very specific command. All of this property is supposed to be from each tribal community, each of the 12 tribes, and only theirs, always theirs, and never to change hands. And they go, huh, probably something like, I didn't think about that before. So they go and they pray about it. They talk to God about it. And God says, yes, they are correct. So here's what I want you to command. I want you to command these five ladies that they can marry anybody they want, but only in their father's tribal community, only in the community of Joseph. Now, don't forget that by this point there are roughly 1.5 million Israelites, so they've got plenty of guys to choose from. It's not a small group of people here, okay? But what's even more interesting than this is right afterwards, um, like the next verse afterwards, they do. They, they marry somebody in the clan. I mean, from the beginning to the end of the story of these young ladies, what I hear is people who want to do right by God. You know? Do right in, in their actions. Do right with their properties. Do right with their marriages. And so as I'm sitting here praying about all this scripture, I'm like, God, where are you leading us? And by the way, I'm really working hard on this one, so please give me a little... Uh, forgiveness here, a little leeway. But I've been sitting here thinking as I'm, I'm trying to get in the minds of these ladies and into this moment, they're really trying to do what's right. And we in the church, we talk about what it means to do right by God with our actions, don't we? And we talk about what it means to do right by God with our property. You know, honor God, don't be wasteful, uh, be frugal. You know, about how often do we in the church talk about what it means to honor God with our marriages? We don't often take time to do that. I mean, these ladies submitted to the commands of God when they came to their marriage because God had a greater and bigger plan. God said, I need you to do this. And they said, we are happy to be a part of what God commands. And God didn't just kind of pigeonhole them. They had a lot of guys to choose from. They wanted to honor God with their marriage. I mean, how many of us can honestly say, yes, I, I try to honor God with my life. I try to honor God with, my, with, with, with what I have and the things that I do and what, how I think and what I say. Do we often think about, I try to honor God with my marriage? I mean, that, that just raises the next question for me. What does it even mean to honor God with my marriage? And, and what's interesting is that you start to raise some interesting questions for me. Now, some of you may, may have a great marriage, and I am jazzed about that. You need to hear me clearly say this. If you have a wonderful marriage, praise the Lord. That's awesome. Celebrate that. But I find more often than not, even in churches, and sometimes especially in churches, that there are people who put on smiling faces and a joyful heart and pretend that the things at home aren't happening. I mean, if I were to sit down and ask you personally, each of you, you and your spouse separately, do you have a happy marriage? What would your answer be? If I were to ask you, do you honestly feel like you can share the deep feelings within your heart, the thoughts on your mind, and know that you'll be met with love, not criticism, not here's how you need to handle that, not, oh, you need to stop that or just grow up, but honestly share in a safe space, do you feel like you have that in your marriage? Are there topics in your marriage that you don't talk about? 
Things that are just off the table. You do not bring up that topic. Are there taboo things? Walls up in that place. Do you feel emotionally safe with your spouse? Or do you feel like you need to walk on eggshells around them all the time? You know, I've been thinking and praying a lot about this. And I think personally one of the reasons why this hits my heart so much is because um, my bride and I have really been blessed this last two, three years. Uh, every six months we, we, we pick a different Christian marriage book and we read it. All right. We spend the week reading a chapter and then on Friday afternoons, um, Friday evenings, we have a date night and we talk about that chapter. And sometimes it's awesome and we have like these great moments sometimes like, yeah, okay, whatever. We've kind of been through this before. Sometimes it's downright uncomfortable. And I honestly read it and go, I don't want to talk about that. Because this is not something that I, I think we're going to hit a roadblock here. This might cause an argument. I don't but it has been phenomenal for our relationship. I mean, it has really changed things for us. Did you know the Bible talks a lot about marriage? And so as I started diving in to find out what does the Bible say about this topic we don't talk often about, and about the topic of love, I started finding some amazing things coming out of here. It says in Ephesians 4, um, chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, Ask yourself this, not, is my spouse doing this for me, but am I doing this for my spouse? Be compassionate, humble, gentle, and patient. Bearing with each other in love. And make every effort to keep unity and the bonds of peace in the Spirit. Am I being patient with my spouse? Or when they come to me, do I go, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever, I don't have time for that right now. Or just, just move on, get past it. Or do I act like my job is more important? Am I gentle with them and their feelings? Do I take it to heart and do I honestly reply to them in a way I wish they would reply to me? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What about this? 1 Corinthians 13. This is called the love chapter. Okay, The whole chapter is about love. But here's like the boiled down part of it. It's in verses 4 and 5. Let me ask you this. Is this how you treat your spouse? And is this how you feel as well about how they treat you? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy and it does not boast. Here's another way to say that. It doesn't try to show off and steal the conversation when something good happens to you. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's amazing. The, the, the people that we know the least in our life, like complete strangers, we tend to treat them the best. We were the most professional with them. We're the most kind, gentle, forgiving. The people we love the most, we tend to be the most critical with and most aggressive towards. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Here's a hard one. It keeps no record of wrong. Imagine taking those out of your fights. Scripture tells us that we are to be compassionate and gentle with our spouses. With, with, with the people who, who they should feel like you are the most safe in their arms and vice versa. That, that you can open up and tell them anything. And even if you don't always agree, and you're not going to always get along, okay, that's called being human, that's called having different personalities, that's okay. But do you honestly feel safe to share with them? And do they with you? I think it's important we take a moment to define this word of love. Because as much as we talk about it in the church, we do try to set the record straight. The world keeps trying to redefine it over and over. They throw it at us so much. 
that they misconstrue the actual definition of love. Love is not emotion-based only. Yes, there's some emotion in there, but the emotions are a byproduct, okay? They're not the roots. Here's the roots. Love is a choice. It is me choosing to put someone else first. It's me choosing to show this person I care for them. If I tell my girls, my baby girls, I love them, but I never have time for them, I'm always working, I'm always short with them, and I'm always criticizing them, when they get to be adults, are you going to think that they're going to go, yeah, my daddy loved me growing up? Then why should we expect our spouses to? Why do we feel, if we're always criticized, that our marriages are perfect? No, love is patient, kind, and gentle. Love is an action. Love is a choice. Love is how you act. It's not just what you say. A big part of that, as I was ta- as I was researching love and, 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 and marriage in the Bible, you know what kept popping up over and over again? Forgiveness. I was floored at how much forgiveness kept popping up. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. What if you forgave your spouse as much as you expect God to forgive you? Do we treat our spouses like they are the enemy? Do we treat them as if everything they say, they always have a uh, um, a hidden agenda behind, a sly hand about? Do we always assume the worst, that they're out to get us? If we're honest with ourselves, is it because something did happen once or twice or a dozen times, but we haven't been able to let go of that something? And so realistically, we live with the person that hurt us the most, and most of that hurt comes only because we assume it's there, not because of what they've done. 1 Peter 4 eight says, Above all, love each other deeply, Because love covers a multitude of sins. Look, the reality is you are going to assume things. I am going to assume things. I stand in the middle of traffic, see a car coming at me. I'm not going to go, hmm, I don't want to judge them. Right? You're going to get out of the way. You're going to make assumptions. If you're going to assume, and you made the covenant to love them your entire life, and they did you, stop assuming on the side of hate. Start assuming on the side of forgiveness, mercy, love, and gentleness. Even if you're wrong, I'd rather be wrong on the side of love than be wrong on the side of hate. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Stop nitpicking. Let the little things go. You know, it's amazing because in our lives, we tend to have a lot of latitude to forgive ourselves. Oh, People should understand why I act this way. I was busy, I was tired, I had a lot going on, da 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 But we don't seem to have very much patience with other people. We criticize others. And I'm not just talking about marriage anymore. I'm talking about your friends, your children, your friends. I'm talking about your neighbors. I'm talking about your family. We can have all the patience in the world when it comes to us. Because we understand us. But we can be really short with everyone else. Once again, we're really nice to strangers. But the people we love the most and should feel the safest around us are the ones that we don't treat the best. There's one other topic that came up over and over again as I was studying the scripture. Uh, in preparation for today. And I want to be very gentle with this. And I want to be very purposeful about this too because um, as I've counseled couples over the years, this is a topic that if we really do open up and they really do talk honestly, it almost always comes up as an issue. Okay? And and that is the fact that Scripture tells us in Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5, that husbands... You have a duty to your wives to care for them physically. And wives, you have a duty to your husbands 
And what you need to understand about this is, is that God has designed us to physically and emotionally need each other. But what we get out of it is two different things often. Not for everybody, but often. Ladies tend to find a sense of peace and comfort and togetherness. And then it is not any more than that. And for gentlemen, if they're not careful, if we're not careful, we can have a physical pressure literally building up into us to a physical discomfort. And that physical discomfort can become pain. And if love isn't cared for the right way, it turns into lust. Okay? This is not permission to bash your spouse and say, you, the Bible says you're required to da-da-da-da-da. This is an understanding of each other and loving and caring for each other. The last thing the scripture just keeps saying, there's so much. I could, I could do an entire series on this and still not scratch it. But the other thing that I kept finding over and over again as I was, treat, as I was diving into what does the Bible say about marriage? What does it look like to have a healthy, godly relationship together? The scripture says, in one way or another, in multiple places, don't be unevenly yoked. In other words, spiritually speaking, if you two are not on the same page, if you two are not worshiping together, reading scripture together, praying together, there will always be a gap between you. There will always be a rift that keeps you apart. Okay? Now, of course, you need to learn how to do that well with each other. That's not always easy. But here's the reality of it. I know some of you, your spouses, just don't do the whole church thing. But maybe today is the day that you say, you know what? Don't do it just for you. Do it for me. I need us to be closer. And hear me clearly say this. I love you and I want every one of you in this congregation. But if your spouse is willing to go somewhere else, I want you to go with them. Okay? I'd rather see you in the kingdom of God than in the castle of this church. I'd rather build up God's house than build up this structure. Come here. We love you. But you need God more. We go on the next slide for me, please. Um, I shared with y'all that my bride and I have been going through this journey together. And, and it's been really helpful. It's, it's really done a lot for our marriage. Um, very positive. And I want to share some of this with you. Because every one of these books I'm about to share with you are ones that I have read and are Christian-based. All right? Yes, this first one is called Men Are Like Waffles and Women Are Like Spaghetti. And this is a book about if you struggle to feel like you're communicating. Men, our thoughts go like this. Let's take care of this project right here. This is the box. So talk to me about that box. I'm done with this box. Then we can talk about that box. Women, your thoughts can typically go 100 directions all at once. They all touch each other, and you can keep us straight. Bless you, my sisters. We don't do that. Okay? But this is a great book written by some Christian counselors. Um, it's a really good starting place for a lot of couples. Next slide, please. The Love Dare is based off of a, a movie. It's called uh, Fireproof. But if you want to grow in your spiritual life, what's called the acts of piety. Okay. Grow in spiritual and physical discipline to be closer to each other and closer to God. This is a great book. I require all couples that I counsel before I marry them to read this book. And I even did it to uh, two people who are 89 years old. Okay? Next slide, please. Four men only, four women only. If you feel like I'm putting everything into this marriage, I'm trying everything I can, they just don't seem to care or they're not responding. And they're saying the same thing to you. This is a great book for y'all. Just sit down and, and this will help you to see and hear how each other, you love each other and how you're expressing it. Another great Christian book on this is called uh, the, the Five Love Languages. It explains how you love and how you receive love. It's a huge eye opener. One more. And this one created uh, for connection. If you're looking for an emotional death, this is the one my bride and I are in the middle of right now. Last night we did our date night because we couldn't do it Friday. I wasn't feeling well. But, but we're in the middle of this one right now. If you're looking for a deeper emotional connection, you just feel like you two have just had a, a disconnect. And you want to get closer. This is a great thing to do. Thank you. You can go ahead. 
Um, God wants more for your marriage. You don't have to settle. Feeling like there's an apathy, there's an emptiness, there's a brokenness. You don't have to say, oh, this is just how it really is in the real world. It's not true. Every one of those psychologists and counselors can testify to it. You've seen good Christian marriages. It's not true. Don't let anything divide you. For what God has joined together, let no one take apart. So what does it look like for you this day to be vulnerable and strong, to be open and yet bold, that your spouse can trust you more than you them? Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I lift up to each and every one of the couples here. And not just the, the couples, but, but all our relationships with our children, with our grands, with our neighbors, with our family and our friends. As we struggle with all of these things throughout many of those areas. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would guide us into what it looks like to treat them the way that we want to be treated. To love them as you love us. To be patient with them as you are with us. In the same way, Lord, if I may be bold enough. For those marriages that are great up here, praise the Lord, we celebrate that. But those whose hearts right now are hurting because this sermon struck a chord. Holy Spirit, please bless them. Give them courage to talk about this outside these walls. We pray this in Christ's name.
For some of you, I'm about to say a phrase that you have thought in your head, but perhaps never said out loud. It feels like we're just roommates. I always have to walk on eggshells around them. I never feel like I'm allowed to be myself. Jesus didn't just set you free from the control of sin and death. He wants to fill you with life in every aspect of your existence. And if God has brought you together, then he wants great things for your marriage. He wants you to find a joy and a peace that passes all understanding. He wants your spouse to become your covenant and safe place. And no, it's not going to be easy. Yes, it's going to be hard. Sometimes it's going to be even be painful. But God wants this for you. Are you brave enough to take it? Receive that as your mission and your blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.